Now let's have a look at how to structure a system. This is assuming you've got um, a bucket of classes about the place. Um, how do you put some structure in it so that it works? Uh, by a bucket of classes, I mean you have all these classes all over the place, um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it, they of themselves form a functioning system. So it probably needs to have some structure in it. So the question is, well, how do you structure it? Well, uh, Hassan Goma has um, a pretty good model uh, where he classifies objects in terms of uh, the, the ones there, the entity object, the boundary object, the controller object, and the application uh, logic object. So these can convert an object-oriented um, design into uh, an architecture at the first pass. Now there's a diagram of it there because I kept thinking of it in terms of a diagram. Uh, we have the controller object in the middle. Uh, in, within the controller object, uh, they're likely to be entity objects that get passed around. They're likely to be application logic objects that, that do various things, but it will be surrounded by boundary objects of different varieties. Uh, in, in a moment I'll go through each of those in turn, uh, but uh, the first thing I want to do is to uh, look at this whole principle of indirection, uh, which is that um, in, in a system a direct connection between one class and another is frequently not a good idea. Uh, you really ought to go through some insulating artifact. And the insulating artifact is a, um, a facade or an adapter or an observer. Using a facade works pretty well. So that um, you have this, this um, as I say, this independent thing, and um, you can um, uh, maintain things fairly independently, and you can update things with a great deal more independence. But if you don't have that, and you have direct connections between the classes, then changes in one tend to require changes in the other, and that's not so good. There's also this whole idea of protected variation, um, and that is where one uh, one class might be updated to include some um, some new functionality. Now, if the if objects are directly connected, then then those kind of changes need to be reflected in those things that connect to it, or those things that it connects to, whatever is the the um, involved in that update. You can avoid that by having um, interfaces, and uh, the the well-defined interfaces can uh, can insulate you from those changes. Now let's have a look at these different varieties of object. Um, Hassan Goma lists out, as I say, the uh, several of them there. The entity object that that's simply a software object. Um, in many cases, it's persistent. It encapsulates a certain amount of information and provides access to the information it, it has. So this is this is uh, something that doesn't is you know the data on which operations are performed. So a, a client might be a um, entity object, or uh, what else might they be in in terms of. Um, a inventory system, then an item would be a, a entity object. It doesn't of itself participate in the um, the workings of the system. There are boundary objects. There are several different varieties of those. The boundary objects are the ones that, that interface between the um, system that you you're building and the the external world. So there is a, a user interface boundary object that interfaces between the the user, you know, mouse, keyboard and that sort of thing, and the system. It gets information from the user into the system and puts information from the system out back out to the user. So that's a user interface um, boundary object. There are also um, direct I.O. objects. Uh, this could be a um, file access object or it could be a device um, uh, device controller object. So if we're dealing with real-time systems, there might be some kind of a gauge or some kind of a control um, control object there. And interfacing between those external, those real-world elements and the, the uh, system we're building uh, 
is the responsibility of a I.O. boundary object. There are a couple of others there. One is a proxy, uh, a proxy um, boundary object, and uh, what have we got? That's it, just a proxy object. There are control objects, a couple of varieties of those, but largely they, the, the whole idea of a control object is that they are an object that sits um, in the system and uh, controls the execution of the system. Um, you know, this is not a dictatorial control, it's just some, somebody has to keep track of it. Uh, this can become quite specialised if you have something like a workflow system. Uh, it can also become uh, quite um, quite extensive if you're dealing with a large control system because you do get into um, different states and different modes and, and how do we know that this, that this system is under control at any one time. Um, we, uh, we do have then the, the um, coordinator objects whose job it is to coordinate events. We have the state transition object whose you know, job it is to, to cause or invoke um, state transition. You know, it gets a stimulus and says, right, we've got to change mode, so it changed mode. And then there are also timer objects uh, whose job it is, um, they would seem to be a fairly subservient thing, but um, they would generate a stimulus that might well change a state or um, cause some things to be coordinated. And then there are application logic objects. The, the main responsibility of application logic uh, objects is to um, you know, perform sizable algorithms. I can think of things like um, data encryption or just encryption generally, um, uh, you know, rendering, um, things that involve uh, significant calculation um, that uh, need to be repeated, you know, you, you don't want this method um, repeated in every class. That would make some really huge classes. So you might as well have a class with, with one method, you pass your parameters to it, you get your answer back, and uh, that's as much as you need to do. So there, there can be these application logic objects whose sole purpose is to contain a, a large-ish, or larger than is convenient, method for doing something. Now, let's go through those um, in a bit more detail. We have a, a user interaction object that communicates directly with the uh, human user, as you see there. The proxy object, as I've said, interfaces to and communicates with external systems. Um, the whole, I, the whole the, you know, the meaning of proxy is it stands for something else. And so far as the, so far as our system is concerned, when it's dealing with the proxy, it's dealing with the thing on the other end of the proxy. Now, how to get things from, to and from the other end, that's the proxy's job. That, that could be through a whole lot of middleware, um, communication, security, and all that sort of stuff. But so far as our consist system is concerned, not our problem. It's the proxy takes care of that. An I.O. object, as I say, provides a software interface to a hardware object, usually um, needed for any, any uh, non-standard application-specific devices. So, um, quite a big deal in um, real-time control systems where ultimately you have to get your information from some um, physical device. So the I.O. boundary object will do that. Entity classes and objects. Primary purpose is to represent something that the system manipulates. So, many systems, information is encapsulated by the entity object and is stored in a file or database. Uh, it is persistent information. An example is a bank account. It is, um, I mean, it's, it is an entity. Uh, it, it, it is manipulated by the system. There's calculations done on it. Right? A controller class. Uh, you need that. The one of the examples I can think of is if you are um, doing some transactions. Say you've got a web-based system and people are booking um, tickets at the theatre. Well, if a person says they want to buy this seat or these seats, you want to put them aside until the transaction is complete. You can't say they're sold because they're not sold until the person pays for them. But you don't want to sell them to someone else between them saying, I want to buy it, and them actually paying the money. So, uh, you know, well, that could be um, seconds to minutes to, to uh, possibly an hour or something like that. 
But the point is, there is coordination required across the entirety of the transaction, so the seats might need to be reserved uh, pending the completion of the sale. Something has to keep track of the coordination of that so that when the sale is made, uh, the various updates are made um, or, or um, continued through, propagated through. And if the sale is cancelled, we get there and they find that oh, it's far too much or I haven't got money today, I'll just cancel the sale. We want to put things back and make them available for sale to someone else. That's the job that a controller object would do. There are also state dependent, um, so, yeah, state dependent control objects. The, the control objects are not dependent on the state. The control objects um, deal with the different states. The behavior varies, sorry, it, it does depend on the state. The behavior varies with each of its states. It receives incoming events and um, transits to a new state to generate outputs to control other objects. Now, I guess the example of this, uh, talk, they talk about machine modes, and uh, I know that in aircraft control systems, there are at least three modes. There is a takeoff mode, there's a cruise mode, and there's a landing mode. And the commands to the system generate different signals to the aircraft depending on the mode. Now, the reason why this is important is because if you get the mode wrong, it'll do some strange things. I mean, you don't want the engines behaving for takeoff when you're trying to land, and vice versa. You don't want the engines behaving for landing if you're trying to take off. It has happened, and it has caused crashes. Uh, timer objects. You receive an interrupt for an external clock, perform an action, and activate an object to perform an action. So they, they really are an object whose sole uh, purpose seems to be to create a stimulus. Application logic, business logic elements, they define the business uh, specific application logic for post processing a client request. They separate the business rules from entities because they change independently. Now it is possible that you might mix up uh, business logic and controller logic in the same object. Um, general principles of responsibility would suggest that this is not a good idea. Application logic. I uh, can think of algorithm things. Um, the encryption algorithm was one I could think of. Uh, if you're doing a biometric analysis or taking a fingerprint or something like that, um, the logic to do with an analyzing the fingerprint and coming back with the, um, the symptoms of it um, would possibly be something you'd stick in an application logic object. Similarly, uh, provide a service on request. Um, I'm thinking in terms of um, microservice architecture systems uh, where this object exists to do something and that something might be a large calculation or it might be a bit of I.O. or something of that nature but it's a piece of application logic. Normally application logic, uh, its, its original purpose was implied something of intensive calculation so that um, that kept it in one place and you didn't have to maintain it in several places. So with all of that in place, I'll now revisit this, this uh, structure and diagram where you have the IO boundary objects uh, at the edges, you have the controller objects uh, in, as you pictured there in the center, because they sit there and just tell everybody else to do things, and you have entity objects and application um, logic objects uh, called on and existing wherever they are required.